are going through negotiations trainings. So what this training is about, well, people have asked me about negotiations through 11 years of coaching and training, and what are the best practices? What can you do? What should you do? Uh, and where does this come up? So today, what we're going to talk about with negotiations training is we're talking about the negotiations between a buyer and a seller for a contract. That's the negotiations we're talking about. There's lots of different types of negotiations throughout a deal. Um, just getting a listing, get, getting new prospects, new clients is a bit of negotiations. But at this point, we're talking about getting through the actual transaction of having a listing primarily focused on that side of it and negotiating with a buyer and getting through that efficiently and effectively so that you can get to the closing table. So negotiation is a very broad subject, okay? Um, and, and really, when it comes to real estate, we're really not negotiating. We are more facilitators than anything else. So we're gonna talk about best practices and we're gonna talk about um, just the steps to go through. And if you have to remember those things, there's basically three main things that we're gonna go over to remember a part of negotiations, okay? So before I get started, I'd like to know a little bit about who I got here today, all right? So does everybody know how to uh, raise their hands on here? Okay. Does everybody know how to raise your hands? There we go, there's a hand, all right? So if you just humor me real quick, you guys can hit that button to raise your hands just so I know that you're live. You know, if everybody can just hit that little raise. So if you look in your little screen, there'll be three little dots that should be in there to raise your hand. So if everybody raise their hand right now, just so I know that you're alive and you hear me, that'd be great because for those of you who don't have a screen, I can't see you. There you go, Angie, that works for me, Angie. If you wanna physically raise your hand, I love that, all right? It should be actually in the screen, you know, um, when you put the cursor over your actual picture on your screen. So, what I'm trying, there you go. If you, if you don't, turn your, picture, turn your camera on, and let's do it that way. That's, uh, that would be great, all right? So you can put your hands down if you'd like, because I wanna know a couple things about who I'm talking to first to make sure that I'm giving you the right information for what you need, okay? So I'm gonna turn your cameras on or raise your hands on this question. Here's the question. The question is this, how many people here are newer to real estate and haven't really gotten into negotiations? Show of hands, who is newer, haven't really gotten into negotiations, okay? We got just a couple there, all right. Um, who's been around the block for a couple of years and had their fair share of negotiations? Show of hands, okay, great. And who's a pro? Who's been doing this for over a decade? You know, closing hundreds and hundreds of deals and uh, looking to fine tune their negotiations. Okay, we got a couple of that, all right. So we have a, a variety of people here on this call, which is great because for people who are new, this is something you wanna know. For people who are, you know, been around the block on this, great, great refresher on things and seeing if you if this is a better way for you to do it. And especially for the experienced people, is that the best way for you to do this? Okay, is there another way? So if anybody has any questions during this call, please hit that raise hand button so I can see that. Um, I'll try to leave some time at the end of this for questions. But I want to get into this. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Brian Ernst. Um, I've been in, in real estate production, meaning I've been in sales, not just a licensee, for the past 16 years. Um, I've closed well over a thousand deals. Um, my focus primarily is on the listing side of things. And that's where I think everybody here should be focused on is the listing side of it. Uh, because listings are the name of the game. And why do I say that? Well, listings get you buyers, listings get you other listings. Listings is advertisement. More importantly with listings is the amount of time it actually takes you to work with the client versus a buyer client. It can take, it can be a half the time of a buyer client, a third of the time, and sometimes even a quarter of the time, statistically, of how much it takes to handle a buyer. So I recommend listings. Are you guys okay with that? I recommend listings. So that's where I'm gonna come from the perspective. So if you're more on the buyer side of things, just be aware I'm coming from the seller side of negotiations and then use that to your advantage, okay? So before I get started, does anybody have any questions? Great, 
and we'll jump right in here. So how does this work? You listed a property, okay? Did you list at the right price? Did you get the right terms? Did you get the right commission? Well, that's a whole other training, all right? That's actually my listing presentation training in EXP world on Tuesdays. For those of you who don't know that, please check that out, it's on the calendar, okay? I think we should, put, I don't know if we have a calendar link for that too, but if we have it, we'll throw it in the chat box, okay? Make sure it's on your schedule. So that's the first part of this, to get into this situation and make sure you got the listing, got it set up right, okay? And now you got an offer that came in, okay? You're the listing agent. Now, the offer could have been emailed to you, okay? It could have been faxed to you. I know I just said fax. I don't even know if I have a working fax machine, okay? It's amazing what people do to send over offers. Some people just send over a text message with a verbal, basically a, a couple terms in it, all right? So when it comes to negotiations, the first rule of this is it needs to be a written offer, okay? A written contractual offer, and on a contract, Let's go with a board approved contract for your area. All right, let's start with that. Because when you get a verbal offer, when you get a text message offer, when you get an email offer without an actual contract in it, yes, as a real estate licensed professional, you have a duty to let your client know that we have an offer. But that's not really an offer. Hey, I'll offer you this much for the property, we'll close on this date. Okay. The, the board contract that I have right now that we use, what is it, 13 pages long or something like that? I, don't, I mean, come on, all right? What terms are we talking about? Because if you want X price minus 20 brand back in concessions, okay, yeah, that's the close date you said, but it's subject to this, 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 you want a home warranty, you have a property you need to sell that isn't even on the market yet, okay, that, that isn't, you gotta make sure you have a complete offer. So if anybody submits an offer to you, make sure it is a complete offer, a complete written signed offer. Now there is some areas out there that it's not customary to sign it, but just to submit it, okay? I'm gonna suggest to have the, that buyer on the buyer's side sign that contract so I know it's legitimate that they wanna move forward. I have a copy of a, a, an earnest money check that they're, they're writing out. Now that doesn't always happen in my area, but if I can get them, I can see their intent that they've written out the check, that they're ready to go. Not that they wrote the check out to the right place or anything, but you know, it's a thought that counts. So this is the first part of it. If you're not even, we're not even discussing negotiations until we have something to negotiate, all right? So make sure we have this. Now for some of you, this may be very basic. For others of you, this may be something that you never knew, okay? But this is something that Oh, this agent, I, I don't have that much time. They want to offer this price. This is what they want. Can you let your clients know? Uh, it's not an offer. It's not a complete offer. I don't, even, I don't even know what you're offering. I don't know what the terms, okay? You guys have a mortgage that you guys are going to get? What are the terms of that? So I need to see that information because I need to share that with my clients. And I sharing limited information um, can't really work with you here until we know what, you, what we're doing here. And that's customary, okay? This is not rules and requirements of things, okay? Some areas, the seller makes an offer to a buyer. That's not really a good way of doing this because the seller already put the price out there. So we get into it. Here are the things that I share with my clients when an offer is submitted, okay? Now, let me take one step back, I'm sorry. When the offer comes through, it's usually emailed to me. I wanna make sure I confirm receipt of it so, so the other agent knows that I have received it. Because I want to make sure I have a relationship with that other agent. I want to make sure that I have a good working relationship so that we can get through that and personalities and egos don't get in the way. Or I've identified there is a personality and ego that is going to get in the way. Okay. So be considerate, be polite. Okay. If they do call you on this, I would call them back. Yep, I received the offer. Thank you very much. I will present it to my client. And as soon as I hear back from my client, I will let you know. So always set the expectations for the other agent. One of the main reasons I've had deals fall apart in negotiations, it's not the main reason, but one of the main reasons is miscommunication. A lot of times the other agent is expecting it to work a certain way and it doesn't. So I wanna make sure I set the expectations and I set the, set the tone for it. What it's gonna mean is this is what I'm gonna do and I will get back to you when I hear from my clients. Or my clients are at work, um, I have sent it to them, 
I have not been able to reach both of them yet. When I am able to, and when they're able to discuss this, I will get back to you. It may be this evening. It may not be till tomorrow morning, okay? But I will let you know as soon as I find out. Keep that communication open. So if, if there's no off, you no, know, your clients don't get back to you by that evening, make sure you reach out to the other agent. Look, I haven't heard back from my clients yet. I know they've been busy. Um, you know, I'll get back to you tomorrow morning about this. Just stay in touch with this. Yeah, this is part of negotiations. It's the setup for negotiations, all right? Make sure this is set up with the right expectations, okay? That is so simple, but so, so few people do it. And if you're on the buyer's side submitting an offer to a seller, to the listing agent, make sure you call them, make sure you text them, and make sure you email them with the written offer and ask them to please confirm receipt of the offer, okay? Because I've had agents that just send me an offer, I never see it, it went to spam or something. I never saw it. They didn't call me, they didn't text me, nothing. And the funny thing is, day, two days, three days later, they still haven't called me. And when I've caught that once in a while, and I just checked my spam folder and I saw it in there, Really? You didn't even call me after three days? I have to actually call them. I go, is this still, I just saw this because it went to my spam. I didn't know that this was, are you guys wanting to still submit this offer? I mean, yeah, it's amazing how, oh, what's the word I'm gonna look for? Incompetent agents can be, okay? You're submitting an offer on a $400,000 property and you didn't even bother to call the listing agent? Come on, this is, this work, you know, I don't even have my phone with me, great. It's just a phone, you can, it, it's actually used to call people, okay? Not only you check emails and texts and Facebook and social media, it's actually used to call people. So having that relationship with the other agent is crucial on both sides of this, okay? So let's think of this. Now I have a written offer. I'm presenting it to my clients. Do you present it in person or do you present it over the phone? Well, ideally I wanna make sure I present it to all decision makers, okay? So if I can get them all on the phone, great. There is a very old school traditional way of doing that is going to their property and presenting it in person. Now, <laughs> I don't do that, okay? Uh, we, we've closed 515 deals in the past three years alone. I mean, that would be a lot of driving around just to present offers. I can't tell you how many offers we've had in that period of time, okay? I've closed over a thousand deals in my career. This is something that if you know is a really good offer, that the, the seller is gonna probably say no to, you might wanna consider meeting with them to discuss this, okay? But in the meantime, I send it to them, and I've hopefully I have prepared my sellers for the offer too, meaning be prepared. They're gonna come in lower. I don't care where they start, I care where they end. Don't take it personally, okay? Set the expectations of this. The negotiations in real estate are, tend to be very, very simple negotiations. The first deal that I ever negotiated, I was on the buyer's side, okay? I remember I was in my car, and I was married at the time. My ex-wife was sitting next to me, and I predicted every counter offer back and forth and where it would end up. And, and she was shocked. She's like, how did you know that? Well, I came from a previous sales business where I've been negotiating deals at least a half a dozen times a day, if not more. And in real estate, it was, you know, agents were negotiating maybe once a month, maybe twice a month. So I could detect a style very quickly in negotiations and they were playing the meet in the middle game. Okay. That was the game they were playing. So present the offer to the sellers. Let's get back to that part here. Hopefully I've set up those expectations that I don't want them to be shocked at the offer when it comes in for 10% less. So what? They start somewhere. They're throwing stuff against the wall to see if it sticks, okay? And you're probably gonna do the same thing if you were on the buyer's side, right? So we don't care where the first offer comes in, the price, we care where their last and final offer is gonna come in. So now we're preparing our seller, okay? Now on the buyer side, if I'm working with a buyer, I'm preparing them to say, if you like this home enough, 
you need to be prepared to pay what they're asking or possibly above. I'm not recommending that they do. I'm not telling them they have to pay full price or above. I'm saying if you want this home bad enough, you need to be prepared to pay what they're asking or possibly above. On the seller side, I'm saying if this is the best offer that you could possibly get, would you take it? Now, remember, this is all confidential with them. I just wanted them to be open-minded to it. I know we're going to get more money typically on these offers, but I just want to prepare them. So I'm going to tell the sellers you have three options, okay? Here are the three options, and you should all know what these three options are. The first option is you can accept the offer. And if they say, Brian, we'll take it, at that point, shut up, send them the contract so they can sign it through, through digital signatures, I recommend, so they can do it right then and there, okay? They say, yep, we'll take it. Now, you can backtrack on some of that stuff to make sure if you see a term that they said otherwise to and said, are you able to close in that period of time? I just want to confirm that. And you may, I would recommend confirming all the terms with them just to make sure they understand the contract. Okay. This is their asking price. This is the credit that they're asking for. Oh, I didn't, I didn't see that. Okay. But if you go through all the terms, they say, yep, that's acceptable. Shut up, send them the contract. It's your duty as a re licensed real estate professional to do what's in the best interest of your client. And if your client wants to move forward, you move forward. This is a big mistake that a lot of agents do where they interject their egos into this. It's the seller's choice on which price they take. Now we can argue about this all day long and say, well, Brian, it came in 5% less and that's ridiculous. Is it, or is it what the client wanted? Did the client want to risk going back and forth? Did the client want to accept it? And if you countered it, had the client counter at a higher price, will that buyer walk away? And if they do, that's risk, okay? Some, may, some people just put in one offer, take it or leave it, and they don't even tell you it's take it or leave it. So the first option is you tell your, your sellers, first option is you can accept this offer. The second option is you can reject the offer, okay? Now, my experience in rejecting an offer is typically people don't come back again. They don't understand. They just think the sellers don't want to work with them or what. I, I remember doing this 16, 16, no, it was 15 and a half years ago, I did this. Um, actually, a property I can see out my window, okay, that long ago. And the agent submitted an offer for, it was 200, um, it was for 200,000 on a $220,000 property, okay? $20,000 off, okay? And what happened from there is the seller said, no, we're not interested in that offer. Not talking about a counter offer, okay? Nothing like that, no, if they wanna offer anything, submit a higher offer. So I went back to the agent, I said, my client has declined your offer. You know, if you'd like to submit a higher offer, I'm happy to present it to my client. Well, I got a phone call because she was a buyer's agent for a big agent in the area, big shot, big ego agent. And he basically threatened to make my life difficult in real estate by rejecting his offer. Okay. He says, I list a lot of properties. I can make your life difficult. Okay. We submit an offer and your clients rejected it. I'm like, are you threatening me on this? Really? Your clients put a low offer in. My clients didn't want to counter offer it. The offer came within 24 hours. If you would like to submit another offer, I'm happy to present it. If you'd like to threaten me, I'm happy to take you to the board, okay? So your license can be removed. Now, I didn't say that at the time, but I sure as heck would of today. But it's amazing how people react to things. So you have choices here. The third choice, remember, accept the offer, reject the offer, and it's not your choice. It's the owner, the seller's choice. The third offer is what? You can counter offer. Now a counter offer is technically a rejection of the offer, right? Not all agents understand that. They just don't. And sometimes if you counter offer, it just puts the ball back in their court. Now who is counter offering? The seller is, not you personally. You're the facilitator. And that's when it comes to negotiations. We don't negotiate anything. We don't have a, we don't have a, ownership interest in that property, correct? So if we do, we have to disclose that in a whole different way, okay? 
That's a whole other subject. We're assuming we don't have ownership interest. So the counter offer is a rejection of that offer. Now you can counter offer any and all terms of the contract, okay? Now it's not you, when I say you, I mean your client. They can reject whatever they like. It could be the price, that's usually what it is. It could be the, the fixtures and personal property. It could be the closing date, all right? So you're not, when you do reject an offer, you're proposing a new offer back to them. And that being said, I would always recommend giving a counter offer back to that other agent to present to the buyer. That doesn't mean come down on price. Let's understand that. I, we're, we're coming, you know, my sellers are counter offering at full price with these terms. That's the counter offer. Counter offer doesn't always mean you have to come down on price. That's a custom. Okay. And that's why the first deal I ever did, I knew exactly back and forth where everything was going to go and where I was going to end up because I identified her negotiation style. It was going to be, let's meet in the middle type of thing. It was just, and that's exactly where it landed. Right in the middle. Everybody works different. Okay. There's different negotiation styles out there. And the more you do it, the more you can see it, the more you get involved with it, the more you'll learn from that. But take a step back and understand your role is more the facilitator, not the negotiator. Now you can put on a song and dance, but you're facilitating negotiations for your client. My terminology is just maybe a little bit different, but your mindset in the right place. So how does this work? You propose and you know, present the offer to the seller. The seller says, I don't want this. Okay. Recommend you counter offer with something, anything or all. Even if they decide to come down on price, you know, thousand bucks, whatever it is. Now, when I do pricing, that's a whole other thing. And we do have those videos that we've done for those trainings in workplace. If you guys want to check those out, all right, on pricing strategy, on CMAs, we put that out there. And that's really one of the purposes of this call is because people have asked me these questions. So do a training on it. So now that we're getting in that negotiations, buyer and seller, okay, the seller has counter offered to the buyer. Now in that process, the seller can be freaking out. They don't want to lose it. Or maybe they, you know, maybe they think that the buyer is being ridiculous, whatever it is. We want to make sure we calm the seller down. Please don't take this personally. This is just somebody submitting an offer. And really most people's second offer if I'm on the listing side, the buyer submits an offer, the seller does a counter offer, whatever it is, the buyer's second offer that comes in is a very good indicator of where things are going to go. So let's pick a price here. Let's pick $300,000. This price is $300,000. The buyer comes in at $270,000. So they're coming in 10% less. Am I doing my math right? For you math majors out there? Okay. So $270,000, your seller freaks out about it, says, no way, I'm not doing that. You know, don't think of it that way. Think of it as leading them to where you want to be. What price do you want to add, end up at, at or better? Well, Brian, we told you, you know, we don't want to go below 290. Great. We want to lead them to that price or higher. Now they came in 30 grand less. That doesn't mean we come down more money because they came in at a lower price. Lead them to the price you want. If you priced it appropriately, which we talked about pricing strategies and some other trainings, it's on Workplace, check them out. All right. You should have priced it appropriately for the market. I don't like to leave room in for negotiations because I'd rather have people have offers not work out versus never having an offer. That's what's so important. Let's see some room for negotiations. Let's price it at 310. Wrong. Because now you're getting in the price range of 300 to 350, not 250 to 300. You got the wrong people looking at it, and you got way more people, double, triple, quadruple, 10 times sometimes in some areas when you're in the lower price range. You got the wrong people looking at it. You want to make sure you're in the right price range. Let's again check out pricing strategies, trainings. So they come in 270. Your seller doesn't want to go below 290. Well, that's no problem. 
I always recommend to my sellers, if you're gonna counter offer, I would come down the most on your first counter offer and then subsequently less from there. So if you came down five grand, don't come down 10 grand after that, okay? Come down one, two, three grand if you're gonna come down after that. And we're trying to figure out how we get this as close as possible, okay? Now, some sellers are stubborn, some are not, some are all over the place, okay? Everybody's different, it's their choice and you're here to guide them through that. But we're gonna an example that said, don't go below 290. Great, if you came back at 295, okay? And they're at 270, we're gonna see on how they react. Now we're just solely going on price. We're assuming the rest of the terms are, are acceptable at this point because price is usually the biggest thing that people are concerned with. So let's just say they said, yeah, come down, we'll come down five grand, 295. You present it to the buyer, the buyer's agent, and the buyer's agent tells their buyer. Now, they're gonna play the meet in the middle game. If you see that they come up five grand, watch how that goes. They come up to 275. They're playing the meet in the middle game. This is, going to be, this is going to be interesting, okay? Because my client doesn't want to come down that low, or at least that's what they're telling me now. And remember this, just because your client tells you one thing now, you still have to present every counter offer to them because they may change their minds at any given point. You have to, have to present it to them. You can't just, even if your client says, if they come back at this, do this. I have to tell you what it is because Remember this, they could get a phone call in between these negotiations from their boss that says they're getting relocated and they need to move right away and they're, real, and they're getting a you know, 50 grand moving package and they don't really care about price at this point, it's more about timing and they'll take whatever price and they just want it done. So you have to go back, even if they say, just do this if this happens, I still have to tell you because something could happen in between there, okay? So if they come up five grand because your seller came down five grand, you can see where this is going, okay? And if, you're, if the seller doesn't want to come below 290 and they're, you know, they're as high as 275 at this point, the whole meet in the middle would be about 285. Well, the seller may come down to that. The buyer may come up more, I don't know. So now the second, let's just say another example, the second offer the buyer makes is not five grand higher, they come up 10 grand higher. Okay, they were trying to see if you know they could get a lower price and it didn't work, but they do want the property. Let's just say the, the, the buyer's counter offer is 15 grand higher, okay? So they're at what, 285, your seller's at 295, you meet in the middle on that one, you got a deal at 290. In my head right there, you got a deal. Statistically speaking, you're gonna put something together. You're, you're close because you know what the seller's willing to do. You can't share that, but you know. Here's another example. The buyer comes back and counter offers at 290, okay? Your seller's at 295. You got yourself a deal there. Now, you may have to go back and forth a few times to see if you get a higher price there, but you know at any given point, your seller would say yes to that. So you present to the seller, look, they're coming back at 290. You're at 295, you have three choices. You can accept it, you can reject it, or you can counter offer it. Remember those three things. If you don't know what to say, don't wanna get your ego involved, tell them those things. Now, if you feel that there's more money on the table and you have that experience to do that, well, great. If you don't have that experience and you don't know what that feels like, because I can't tell you how many deals I've been involved in negotiating with throughout my sales career, and there are times that I tell people, look, you, you gotta go back and forth. This personality type that we're dealing with, they're gonna think that you just, you caved in and you know, they paid too much. There are some styles of negotiation that I can identify that. Can't explain it to you guys that quickly here. It's more of doing it over and over and over, all right? So let's, for the example, they came back at 290. We first proposed 295 to them. Once again, you can accept it, you can reject it, or you can counter offer it. And if they say take it, take it, okay? Yes, we can be concerned about a list price to sale price ratios, all these different things, but you have a duty to your client to move forward if they said yes. And I have agents who will argue with their sellers and say, no, you can, no, 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 there's more money, you should do this, 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 and this. Well, you can recommend things, but ultimately it's their decision. Okay, 
and be careful on walking that line. I've seen a lot of agents that put too much of their opinions on negotiations and they're breaking license law. They're breaking the code of ethics because they're not representing their clients and their, their client's wishes. Just because you would do it a certain way doesn't mean they want it done a certain way. And when they tell you to do it a certain way, it's your duty to follow that. And that's what saves you time in negotiations, okay? Saves you time. I've had negotiations on a residential property last for six months. I've had negotiations last for six seconds, okay? So it's real important at a certain point to just allow them to move forward, whether you agree or disagree. Keep your opinions out of this. Remember, we're more facilitators than negotiators. And if we prepare our clients up front for this process, it goes a lot smoother. So I like to prepare my seller clients for the fact that they're gonna come in lower and that's okay. Brian, we don't wanna go, we're at 300, we don't wanna go below 295. Okay, well, it's the same game here. We're gonna to try to tailor the counter offers to be at 295 or above, not end at 295, ideally above. They came in at 270. All right, we're gonna counter offer at 295, 298. Well, just wanna let you know that they could walk away from this. And I'm just preparing my seller for what's gonna, what could possibly happen on every counter offer. They may not accept this and they may walk away. Are you okay with that? Just wanna make sure they know. I'm describing what I've done thousands of times, okay? And I wanna make sure that they are educated enough to make that decision. And when they make the decision, you move forward with this. There's a lot of negotiations out there where the wrong people are actually negotiating, meaning the agents are not negotiating, not facilitating. And yes, our duty is to do what's in the best interest of our client. And if we need to educate our client about that process, ideally it is done beforehand because how emotional this process can work be for people, okay? And they will ask you to do things that you should not be doing. That does happen. This is a part of the process. But I want you to know this part of negotiations. If you have a nice property, a listing, it's in great shape, it's in move and ready condition, new carpet, freshly painted, you know, new appliances, it's move and ready. There's nothing major that needs to be done to the place. No major updates or renovations, those things need to be done. And you priced it appropriately. Well, you can be confident that it is going to sell. And sometimes that other agent is going to make you feel like, is going to try to make you feel like you're so ridiculously overpriced. Well, guess what? They're representing their client. They're going to put on that song and dance. And if we're on the listing side of it, we're going to put the song and dance on is that we're selling a castle, even though it's a double wide out back. Okay. That, you know, <laughs> got a hole in the roof. Well, you disclosed it. It's disclosures. It's disclosed. But everybody has different standards of living and everybody wants to live in something different. It's not our place to judge that. We're here to give them what they ask for, okay? So if I'm on the seller's side, I'm selling a castle and it's priced appropriately. And I'm gonna put on that front that that's what it is. I'm not gonna give away any information. I'm not gonna give away any confidential information about what the seller wants to do. Too many agents give up confidential information through this process, okay? Here's one of them. Hey, Brian, do you have any offers on this property? That's confidential information. I cannot reveal that information without my client's permission. I hope you can understand that. I hope you can appreciate that. If you're interested in putting an offer, I'd recommend you do that. And I'm happy to present all offers to my clients. Now, you don't know which way they're, as a buyer agent, they don't know which way. Do they have offers? Do they not have offers? I don't know. Because think of this way. I've answered that question many times through my career, and I should have never have done that. And, the, and I said, yep, we got two offers. Okay, we're not interested in them. When you thought, hey, we have two offers, we get three offers. But you shared that information and they walked away because they didn't want to be in a bidding war. And those two offers can be ridiculously low and going nowhere, but you want to play them against each other. On the other hand, you have no offers and you know these people, if there was another offer, would go higher on price. No, we have no offers. Okay, great. We're coming in 50 grand less now. You don't know that. 
This is confidential. Does anybody here disagree with that statement? That when you have an offer for your seller client and another agent is asking if you have an offer, can you share that information? Does anybody believe you can share that information without your client's consent? Okay, just wanna make sure. Just wanna make sure I'm on the same page with everybody here. And these are some basic techniques to get in negotiations where you don't show your hand. You don't show your cards to the other person. And you have to do it in a manner that you're not giving it away in your tone of voice. Remember, words are as little as 7% communication. They're gonna to listen to the tone of your voice, your inflection, if they can physically see you, your body language. This is a challenge for some people. So I recommend when you have that situation, multiple offers, you do not disclose that information. You share, I can, I'm, I'm sorry, I cannot disclose that without my client's written permission. And that's actually in Illinois what it's technically, it's written permission. But you need the seller's permission to do that, okay? This is the joy of this. If you price the property correct, correctly, you have a buyer over here, you have a seller over here, they're gonna figure it out. And you're just going back and forth on certain things. And if you prep your client ahead of time of what to expect with this, it goes much smoother. If you're negotiating five, six, seven offers on one listing, you have a problem, okay? And they don't go through. And this happens from time to time. Doesn't happen to everybody, but if you have a half a dozen offers on a property and the seller has not accepted one, at some point, have you discussed with the seller, this is what the market is telling you. This is what they're telling you on price. If this is the best you could do, would you take it? No, I wouldn't take it, Brian. Okay, we probably have a problem here because we're getting these offers, they're not going above this price based off of this criteria, which we discussed in the beginning, which is my fault for overpricing a listing from the start and setting the wrong expectations. I blame myself on those things. I don't blame them, they're the public, okay? They don't do this every day, we do. We're real estate agents. We're the real estate professionals. We need to act like that too. So when you get in that situation, if you haven't set up those expectations and the seller keeps saying, no, 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 you're gonna to need to advise your seller to say, this is what the market is telling you. And you have several choices. You can wait for another offer to come in and be by, and by the way, when you get the first offer that comes in, seller's gonna say, let's wait till the second offer comes in. There may never be a second offer. A bird in the hand's worth two in the bush, okay? Everybody heard of that? Don't try to chase after something you can't get when you have something in your hand. There may never be another offer. And in Illinois, we have an attorney review period in the first five business days, which is basically an out clause, that you can kill a deal. Any reason other than the stated purchase price. Okay, you can say, oh, we didn't like the font on the contract. It's irrelevant. You know, if you have to say it, the attorney can just disapprove the contract. So it eases my client's fears of saying if another offer came in, could they accept it? Sure, we could kick out the other offer and we could accept the other offer. If it's not solely based on purchase price. If it is, we just be careful in disclosing, not saying that, <laughs> okay? We wanna represent our clients in their best interest, okay? It is so much easier than most people think if you keep your ego out of it. The people who get their ego involved with it spend way more time with this. And it causes more problems too because if a buyer's agent is riding on the buyer's enthusiasm or lack thereof, and they're putting their ego involved, they, it's, it's being dispassionate about helping your clients. And on the seller side, it's much easier to do that, in my opinion, okay? Because we're waiting for the offers to come in versus the buyer writing the offer and getting them to actually write the offer. This is a process. If you priced it right, it's pretty much gonna work itself out and you're just gonna be the messenger most of the time. Now, do I recommend verbal counter offers or written counter offers? Well, that's gonna be subject to your state in your area, okay? I generally do verbal counter offers for a variety of reasons. Number one, if we get in a multiple offer situation and I, we do a written counter offer, we have to wait till they reject that 
or we rescind the offer before we can address the other offer. Verbal is a lot different. We can do it much quicker and we can tell all parties, look, we're in a multiple offer situation and we rescind our counter offer to you. We're asking for all parties to bring their highest and best offer to the table. And that is when you're getting a multiple offer situation. And by the way, you cannot say these things without your client's permission. Just because you're in a multiple offer situation doesn't mean you can tell everybody you're in a multiple offer situation. Make sure your client understands, because I've had quite a few clients that says, this is the offer I want, let's go with this one. I, I'm not really concerned with this. I, I like the financing and the, the close date better. This is the one I wanna go with. At that point, it's your duty. Write up, you get the deal signed, get written up by the other agent. I always recommend that the buyer's agent writes it up and rewrites the offer and they have their client sign it so they're just waiting for our signature. Because I don't want the seller to write up the offer with their signature, send it to the buyer's agent, the buyer's agent scratches out some terms, their buyer signs it, and we don't know who scratched what out because it wasn't initial property properly. That is a problem. So on the seller's side, I wanna always protect my sellers and their interest. So I always wanna ask the buyer's side politely to send over the updated offer. It, they don't have to do it that way, okay? But that's how I recommend it. And for the most part, that's how it works, at least in my deals, at least in the Chicago metropolitan area because I'm in the Chicago suburbs. Everybody's got a different style for this. We're more facilitators than anything. And I would guess, like, probably a majority percentage of time, if you just present the offer, give the seller the options, it, you'll go back and forth and it'll work itself out. The majority of the time, it just, it'll work itself out. I don't really like to email a lot of counter offers because I don't know if that tone is gonna get across correctly. Now I do from time to time, I do, here's the counter offer, this, this, especially the agent says, can you email me the counter offer? Can you type that up so I can forward it to my clients? Because that's what I'm concerned with. I wanna make sure the tone is read by the other party correctly. Because I, I, we have a lot of attorney paperwork that we deal with, and the tone of it is like awful. Okay, people get freaked out when they see attorney letters because the just the, the language it's written in. Okay, so negotiations, but don't think of your you negotiating. Think of you being a facilitator and presenting it and giving them the options. And sometimes you got to hold back on vomiting your opinion on people if they don't want it. Now, if they need certain things and they just make sure they clarify, okay, are you comfortable on this term? And on this term, this term, this term. Wanna make sure you're okay with these things and you understand this. That is something that we need to make sure we do with our clients on both sides. So what do I recommend whenever an offer comes into my seller? It's real simple. You can accept this offer, you can reject the offer, or you can counter the offer, which is technically a rejection of the offer, and you can counter any and all terms of it. What would you like to do? And put the ball in their court to make the decision. And if they have questions, they will ask me. If they gave me directions, I may ask questions to clarify their directions, especially if I don't think it's in their best interest. I will tell them, uh, I don't think it's in your best interest, I will do this, but this could happen if you do this. And whatever offer that they say, I wanna counter offer this price. Okay, so I'll let you know, they may not accept that and they may just walk away. They may not counter back. I just wanna make sure you're prepared for that. There are other options that they can pick. I'm just confirming that's what they wanna do. I'm not pushing them anyway, just preparing them. Negotiations for me, is more preparing my clients for the next step, okay? And I have a little emotional equation here that I'd like to use. I don't know where I got it, emotional equations. One of them says, expectations minus reality equals disappointment. Show of hands, how many people have had disappointing clients in negotiations before? Yeah, okay. Where were the expectations? That is, the point I want to get across to everybody, if you know anything about negotiations, is preparing them for it could go any way. The buyers may never come up on price. 
They may always want a far off close date. They may all ask for home warranties where you don't want to pay for a home warranty. I, whatever it is, okay? Everybody may ask for a closing cost credit. They all may be FHA loans. If that's the best you could do, would you take it? And explain to them what it really means. And if you don't know what it really means, get somebody to explain it to you what that type of contract means so you can explain it to your clients. If you're just brain dead and you get an offer, all you gotta do, confirm receipt from the other agent, forward it to your client, ask them to reach out to you. And I would always make sure you delete a lot of the information so that your client doesn't misunderstand to talk to the other agent. Put in the message, please call me. Once you've had to take a good look at this, please call me to discuss. And then I would call them immediately. What's the time frame? Now, I don't have a time frame in my area on how fast negotiations need to last, okay? But typically with negotiations, the more motivated the buyer, if they've just looked at the property, they put an offer in right away, they're pretty motivated. So I would go faster on negotiations, meaning as quick as I can get a hold of my clients. If they saw a property a week ago, then put an offer in, they typically aren't as, as motivated. It's just been my experience because they, they not even, haven't been in the property in a week. The emotions have died down. The logic has kicked in. They've talked to the lender. They're looking at payments and other things. They're thinking dollars and cents. Somebody usually is because they didn't pull the trigger right then and there. It's a lot of things that come up in negotiations. It's very challenging to get through. I just want to keep this simple for everybody here. Don't overthink it. Give your clients the choices. Okay? And if you know that this is... I always say, if this is the best offer you could get, would you take it? I just want to know. I can't share that with anybody, but just for yourself, if that's the best offer you could get, would you take it? And most of the time, no, no, no. But it's amazing, six months later, what they say, okay? But I don't, the average time for me, the majority of my listings sell in seven days or less. The majority of my listings sell in seven days or less. I don't care what the market time is for the average of the area. If we priced it correctly for what's going on in the area, two weeks, 10 showings, whichever comes first, and we're talking about residential homes in affordable price ranges. We're not talking about $5 million properties here. We're talking about things that you can get 10 showings in two weeks type of property. Not that ranch out in the middle of nowhere on 50 acres, okay? <laughs> you need a freaking helicopter to go over. No, 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 I'm not talking about that. That's a whole different thing. So what questions do you have that I threw out? Yeah, I threw a lot of stuff at you guys. I want to leave some time to talk about this. What questions do you have? And remember, if you have a question, somebody else probably does too. Don't be shy. Hit the raise hand button and uh, let's talk about that. Or you can physically raise your hand too. I, you know. Nikki, you have a question? No, you don't have a question. All right. This is on you guys. What do you guys want to know? What do I need to clarify? All the fun stuff. Polly, your eyes are wide open. What's on your mind, Polly? Um, well, I'm just trying to absorb it all. Um, I had a situation, uh, it was one of my first, one of my first times in which I learned after the fact that this this particular buyer, I was working for the seller, and this particular buyer was actually making offers on multiple homes. Sure. And, yeah. and it was my first experience with that. Matter of fact, it was my very first sale. Well, it didn't happen. It wasn't my first sale. It was my first negotiation. Okay. And um, and you know we didn't get it, et cetera. And that's when I learned later on that he'd made like four different other offers on different properties and stuff. Yep. And I kept going back through it, trying to figure out what were the clues that I missed, you know, and, and things like that. And other than just inexperience, I know sometimes that people do that. How do you, how can you, you know, not look like such an idiot to your client when you have somebody that does something like, is there something that you need to be looking for to negotiate when that happens? Or very, it's a very good question. And you work with the information that you have because how did you find out that they put four offers in how did you find that out um 
after a period of time and it, nothing was happening, I you know, went back to the agent and I actually physically went to the agent and just sat down and, and all. And we just kind of got into just a general conversation and he just kind of smiled. And then that's when he told me, this guy put in four different offers in four different homes. And guess what? He didn't buy any of them. And then he went away. I'm like, what? So, but I just didn't know if there was something that. I, right there. That's why I don't get too emotionally tied up in an offer. Yeah. Just because you have an offer doesn't mean you have a deal. There are certain agents that do that. In some areas it's unethical and other areas that there's yeah. no ethical problem of that. Here, my client wants to buy a property. They're going to submit six offers on six different properties. And whoever gives us the best, whatever, based off of our evaluation of that, we're going to move forward with. And then we're going to reject all the other offers and we're going to rescind all our other offers. Yeah. Now, in some areas that is unethical. Okay. Because you're putting the intent out there on the buyer's side that you can afford all those other properties. And if the seller signs it, you're locked into it. Now, see, in my area, we have attorney review and we can kick it, kick the deal out, the buyer or seller in the first five business days. And a contract's not a contract until it's signed and received by all parties. And that's why it's specific to your contracts in your areas. Yeah. And there's nothing. You have a due diligence period. And that's right. determined. Right. So similar to what you're saying, but it can be any time frame. That has as long as you have the ability to get out of the deal, yeah. if you're the buyer's side doing that. Yes, I, I have had that happen to me. And I'm just presenting to the client. Here you go. This is the offer. Would you like to accept it, reject it, or make a counteroffer? And I usually figure it out when we make a counteroffer and we don't hear back at all. Nothing. Radio silence. They're looking at yeah. our properties. Yeah. And we didn't counter offer enough for that particular buyer, typically speaking. So what? Your client wouldn't want that price anyways. Move on. Okay. Unless you've been sitting on the market for 12 months and that's the only offer any offer you ever had, you might want to encourage your client to just take whatever price it is too. to say, if that's your best offer that you're going to get and it's been 12 months. Okay. Always prepare them for that counter offer may never come. So, don't give yourself any, you know, you, if you look back on it, that agent isn't going to want you to know that. Okay. I actually have had agents say, we're putting an offer on this many properties. Whoever gets us the best, we're going to go forward with. And I have had agents who flat out said that. Thanks for telling me. We're not interested. You know, my, my seller is not interested, but thank you very much for that offer. It's great, Polly. It's great. Other questions? I'm in. Hi. Uh, usually, how long of a time you put for offers or counter offers? Well, there's no exact time frame for my area. Um, if the written rule, I think it says in a timely manner, so it's not specified. But I like to, to all I want to do is set the expectations with the other party that I'm going to get back to them at this time. That's what's so important. So I tell my, when my clients ask me that question, I tell them in a timely manner. So the first opportunity that you really have to look at the contract, discuss it with all decision makers, you know, and I'm not saying you're going to take the week to do it, meaning you got 24 hours. I want to know by, okay, you know, by the end of the day here, so I can get back to the agent because if we don't respond in a timely manner, they don't think we want to move forward and they're going to go somewhere else. And do you want to risk that? And also, do you want to risk the new properties coming on the market tomorrow for them to see those when we can negotiate this deal and be done right now. So timing, I want to make sure I move as quickly as possible on it without killing myself in the process. All right. If I have something on my schedule, I will forward it to my clients and I will go on my other appointments and then I will talk to them afterwards. Okay. There's another, another classic we, we would put on the workplace there. Uh, scheduling for success. So uh, you could literally schedule the time of the day when you're going to negotiate deals too and return calls and set those expectations with your sellers. But I would like to, let's just say that if, you, if the offer came in right here and now, I would tell my clients if I could get a hold of them, we'd like to get back to them as soon as possible with a, with a response. Now, if we know another offer is coming in, but we don't know that for sure. And by the way, Never tell your clients there's an offer coming in until it's come in. If you do that 
and the offer doesn't come in, they are likely to blame you for it. And agents get excited when they see a buyer that wants to move forward. They wanna make sure it's available, let you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't even tell my clients this because it's nothing. It's not a written offer. I have nothing to tell them. But if I'm in a conversation, I may share that with them, but I will tell them it means nothing until I see something in writing. But a lot of times I'll put it in the feedback that, yep, we're writing an offer and we have an offer, so when's a timely manner? So let's just say that happens. And Ahmed, we, we wanna get back in a timely manner, but we also wanna see what this other offer is if it comes in. Well, I delay it. How do I do that? I set the expectations is look, my clients are at work right now. They will discuss this this evening and they told me when they have a chance, they'll get back to me tomorrow morning. And as soon as I hear from them, I will let you know. That's all I did, setting the expectations. Brian, we wanna hear an answer tonight. You know, we, we need this, this, this. Um, 16 years ago, I would see on contracts, we want, an, we want a response within 24 hours or we rescind this offer, okay? I used to see a lot of that. But that was much more in a seller's market. Everything was selling. When it switched to a buyer's market, you didn't see that as much, okay? And now, well, depends on what market you're in. I'm in a seller's market and a buyer's market, depending on the area. So, Ahmed, does that help you? Yes. Uh, if you forgot to put time on your counter offer and the other party comes back to you a week later with counter offer and mean, meanwhile you have sold the property, yep. you have a contract with another party, how liable are you going to be? Liable or re reliable? Uh, when uh, you forget to put time and the other party can't come back to you too late right. and you did another action with another party, are you responsible or not? Well, that's going to be subjective depending on the situation and there's going to be more details needed for that before I could answer that correctly because I don't know specifically your rules in your area on that. I like to generally follow up and I give a counter offer the balls in their court and anything can happen. Okay. Now we do have that provision in our contract that you have five days for the turn of review, five business days. So it's seven days for the other weekend. But if somebody comes back after that and says, yep, we want this for a better price. Okay. You snooze, you lose. Sorry. And, and sorry to our clients too, if it was a better offer. But that doesn't come up that much. That really doesn't. Though I have, you know, I've taken six months to negotiate one single deal, a residential deal before. So usually they don't come back quite like that. And if they do, that's just kind of a weird situation to be in. And at that point, you're already moving forward with somebody else. And I like to share with my clients, if that would ever come up, my perspective would be, look, how reliable are they gonna be if they're responding over a week on our counter offer when we need to get their mortgage approval done and close on time? You wanna trust that? So, and it could be the buyer or it could be the agent setting that expectation or allowing that to happen. So I would, has that come up for you, Matt, before? Thank you. Uh, no, uh, but uh, that was, uh, that's an interesting subject. I appreciate that. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, we're at our time here. I've got to get to my next call. I want to thank everybody for being here. Okay. If anybody's interested in, um, geez, a strategy session call with me, if I can answer further questions on this, please let me know. The link is in the, uh, the chat box here. You can click on that. If you want to set up a time to talk to me, I'm happy to talk to you. If I can help you and point in the right direction or answer more questions. And if you're interested in the first 10 secrets of my 52 secrets that I have and the upcoming book is coming out here next month, uh, there's a link for that too. It's in the chat box. If you guys are interested, please check, check out that. Um, just see strategy session call, let's see 10 secrets. Oh, if some of the other, the, the price uh, strategy, there's a few links. Check it out. Thanks everybody for being here. Hope you guys have a good one. Oh, 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 oh,